What is it about the Asia world that fascinates us so much? Is it the mysteries that surround it, the secrets it holds, or the fact that these relics are the foundations upon which our modern civilization was built? For whatever reason, today we're going to take a journey. A journey back in time to discover the world's oldest known man-made objects. We'll explore the craftsmanship, the ingenuity, and the sheer human determination that went into creating these artifacts, some of which are so old they actually predate Homo sapiens. Our first objects of interest are so old that they bend the very definition of man-made, dating to roughly some three million years before Homo sapiens even evolved. We told you it was before Homo sapiens. These objects, the world's oldest known stone tools, were unearthed at the Longqui 3 excavation site in Kenya. These early implements of technology, including rudimentary hammers, anvils, and cutting tools, literally rewrote the book on the history of human development, surpassing the age of the previous record holder by hundreds of thousands of years. The crafters of these tools remain identified, but their creation challenges the previously held belief that the manufacture of stone tools, along with the evolution of other human characteristics, such as increased meat consumption and possibly the use of language occurred simultaneously with the emergence of the Homo genus. Until this discovery, the earliest evidence of stone tools was traced back to 2.6 million years ago in Ethiopia. Homo habilis, an early ancestor of modern humans, is believed to have crafted these tools characterized by choppers with one refined edge, in a style known as Old One. The advent of these tools was thought to coincide with Africa's changing climate as forest canopies receded, giving way to savannas, which in turn led to the emergence of the Homo genus around 2.8 million years ago. This environmental shift was also posited to have brought about the exploitation of new food sources and hence necessitated the development of tools to process them. However, this perspective has been recently scrutinized, even before the discovery of the Longqui tools. In 2010, researchers discovered animal bones in Kenya dating back 3.4 million years, bearing marks alleged to have been made with a stone tool. The only known human ancestor present at that time was Australopithecus afarensis of which Lucy is a well-known example. They would certainly have been theoretically capable of making stone tools, even if archaeological evidence to prove it was then lacking. Analysis of discovered skeletons would imply that they had the grip strength to use such tools, and furthermore, observations show that chimpanzees use rocks as hammers or anvils in the wild, and bonobos can create stone tools under guidance, making the possibility just that bit more tenable. Given this lack of evidence, then, the discovery of the Lomqui just a year later in 2011 was most fortuitous, as while it provided no certain evidence that pre-humans of Lucy's type were the exact ones making tools, it did at least show beyond doubt that someone was using tools in that period. The Longqui tools themselves were discovered on an expedition led by Jason Lewis of Rutgers University and Sonia Harmond of Stony Brook University. They ended up at the Longqui 3 site following a navigational error, but soon found their attention drawn to the geological features of the area and decided to treat this mistake as a happy accident. They soon discovered vaguely tool-like stones embedded in the sediment. Upon closer inspection, these stones bore scars indicative of a process known as napping, which involves striking rocks together to produce flakes, proving them to indeed be intentionally fabricated tools. Geological data suggests that these artifacts were at least 2.7 million years old. However, subsequent analysis of the tools themselves revealed them to be even older, dating back 3.3 million years. These Longqui tools opened a Pandora's box of questions. Were they connected to the older one tools? Who made them? And why? Were they crafted by Kenyan Thropus, Platyops, another early hominin species, or perhaps by a yet unknown member of the human genus? And what does it all mean for our understanding of human evolution if a hominin outside the human genus created them? These are all questions that have yet to be answered due to a lack of conclusive evidence. And the Longqui tools also stir curiosity regarding their creation process. Analysis suggests the toolmaker could have placed the stone on a flat rock and chipped away at it with a hammer rock, or held the stone with two hands and hit it against a flat base rock. But ultimately, these are just suggestions, and until further evidence surfaces, our knowledge of the Longqui tool's creation will remain restricted to the realm of informed speculation. The one thing that's not up for debate is the innate curiosity the Longqui tools conjure. The notion of pre-humans running around with primitive tools inherently sets the mind wandering, and no doubt this innate curiosity, coupled with the many holes in our understanding of them, will leave academics pontificating over this one for many years to come. Hidden in the Homa Peninsula in southwestern Kenya, amidst the landscape that surrounds the birthplace of humanity, 
Eliza Portal to our ancestral past, the Kanjera South Archaeological Site. Here. Between 2.6 and 1.6 million years ago, at the height of the Stone Age, our hominin ancestors were hard at work taking their tentative steps into the world of technology. The Kanjira South site was established in 1987 after the collaborative efforts of the National Museums of Kenya and the Smithsonian's Human Origins program under the stewardship of paleoanthropologist Richard Bodds. Teaming up with American educated archaeologists, including Thomas Plummer, a doctoral student from Yale University, Pods began excavations that would soon unearth a breathtaking legacy of those tentative technological steps, the Kanjira tool. This quartzite stone tool, approximately two million years old, is the oldest human-made artifact within the Smithsonian's collection. Brought to the US on loan from the Kenyan government in 2011 for their assistance in discovering it, the Kanjira tool bears witness to countless years of utilization. Its multiple edges bear the scars of rigorous use. The tool's working ends are marked by flakes, evidence of deliberate chipping to create sharp, serrated edges ideal for cutting. Its other side remains flat and smooth, serving as a comfortable handle, suggesting a well-thought-out design and purpose. Intriguingly, the stone's reddish-iron color, which would ordinarily suggest a volcanic origin, is misleading, and in fact, geological analysis revealed it as quartzite, a non-volcanic rock. This suggests that early humans may have sourced the stone five to six miles away from Kanjira South and subsequently used the tool at several other locations before it finally came to rest for millions of years at its discovery site. To craft a tool, as sophisticated as the Kanjira stone required a calculated process. It's speculated that a hominin would utilize a hammerstone to serrate the new tool's surface, creating sharp edges capable of cutting a variety of materials ranging from animal flesh to vegetation and wood. This innovative ability to produce sharper tools allowed early humans to broaden their dietary options, introducing tubers into their meals and escalating their consumption of meat, as meat could now be scavenged from larger kills. According to Richard Potts, a prominent academic whose work concerns early human civilization, these tools empowered our ancestors ancestors to adapt to a range of environments, enhancing their survival prospects amid a dynamic world of environmental change. There's also a theory suggesting that this very diet could have contributed to the observed increase in human brain size during this period, marking a significant evolutionary milestone. But like the Lomqui tools before it, for every one question the Kanjira answers, two more seem to rise to fill its void. Sure, we now have concrete evidence, or should we say stone evidence, of a rudimentary tool use in this area all those millions of years ago. But as for how it was made, how it was used, and the thought processes that drove its construction, well, ultimately, there's not very much we can do to answer those questions. We can just speculate, at least for now. So let's bring the clock forward a few million years, shall we? Lest this entire video be about, I mean, admittedly quite interesting stones. So let's begin to have a look at the earliest known examples of specific objects. And let's start with the most humble of objects, that which protects our feet from the elements, keeping them from getting scuffed, and from many provides a direly appreciated vector for peacocking and chest beating. It's the humble shoe. I see you in your air, Jordans. The tale of the oldest known shoe begins in the islands of Armenia in a small cave named Arni 1. This cave is a natural time capsule rich with antiquity and has been the setting for a multitude of important finds, all narrating a distinct chapter of human prehistory. Among the cornucopia of treasures on Earth, one particular find does stand out, a perfectly preserved 5,500-year-old leather shoe, which you might have already guessed from this entry's title, is the oldest shoe ever discovered. Situated at the Arpa River and the village of Arnai, the cave complex is a silent testament to the longevity and complexity of human existence, providing a natural storage space that kept artifacts, including the aforementioned shoe, shielded from the harsh elements, thereby ensuring their survival. The shoe itself was discovered in 2008 during an excavation led by an international team of archaeologists. Nestled beneath layers of sheep dung, which contributed to its preservation by creating a sealed, dry, solidified layer, lovely, the shoe amazed researchers with this level of preservation. It was not a mere fragment, nor an abstraction left to the interpretations of trained experts. It was a wholly recognizable and surprising 
amazingly modern looking piece of footwear. Made from a single piece of cowhide leather, a technique known as one piece leather construction, the shoe was stitched together at the front and back with leather cords, revealing a sophisticated understanding of footwear construction far earlier than previously believed. The shoe, designed for the right foot, demonstrated an uncanny resemblance to moccasin shoes, typically made of one piece of leather and notable for their practicality and durability. The interior was filled with grass, the function of which remains a topic of debate among researchers. Some posit that the grass served as an ancient insulation method, a buffer between the foot and the raw leather, possibly offering added comfort and warmth in Armenia's harsh winters. Others suggest the grass might have been used to maintain the shape of the shoe when it was not worn, an insight into the prehistoric wearer's regard for the preservation of their belongings. The shoe was not an isolated find. The RNI one cave is indeed an archaeological treasure trove, rich with artifacts that shed light on prehistoric human life. From the world's oldest winery to human skulls that were used in mysterious rituals, the cave is offered an intimate, intricate glimpse into the human past. But perhaps it is the shoe, in its surprising mundaneity and familiarity, that resonates most with modern audiences. The discovery of the shoe did not just revolutionize our understanding of prehistoric fashion or shoemaking techniques, but also painted a picture of the daily life, customs, and traditions of the people who lived in and around the cave during the Copper Age. Every stitch, every crease, every sign of wear on its sole tells us a story of a single individual from a time long past. What makes this shoe especially fascinating is that footwear is rarely preserved in the archaeological record. Shoes, like all clothing items, are usually made from perishable materials that decompose over time. Thus, their presence in the historical record is often inferred indirectly from other types of evidence, like artistic depictions, written references, or imprints left in ancient clay. The Arnai Wan shoe, therefore, offers a precious, tangible link to our ancestors, a silent yet resonant testament to the daily life of prehistoric humans. Let's now leave the humble shoe behind and head to the elevated realm of music, an integral part of human culture since, well, human culture has been around. More specifically, let's focus on the Divjay Baba flute, the oldest musical instrument ever discovered. Probably. It all began in the heart of Slovenia's scenic landscape when Dr. Ivan Turk, a Slovenian archaeologist, stumbled upon the fascinating artifact in 1995. Etched from the femur of a cave bear, this flute is purportedly around 50,000 years old, a date that, if ultimately correct, would make this unassuming piece of bone the world's oldest known musical instrument. The age alone adds layers of wonder and intrigue, offering a unique window into the lives and culture of the period. The discovery of the flute captivated the musical and archaeological worlds alike. Oh, one who was particularly taken aback was Canadian musicologist Bob Fink, who, in a riveting essay published in 1997, attempted to explain the musical qualities of the flute. He claimed that the whole spacings on the bone aligned perfectly with four notes of diatonic scale, comparable to the unique finger-like spacing of our modern minor scale flutes. This is certainly a captivating theory, suggesting that our Neanderthal ancestors may well have possessed an understanding of music more sophisticated than we may have initially imagined. However, as with any revolutionary find, some skeptics view the holes not as a mark of ancient music, but as mere remnants from a carnivore's feast, possibly a hyena. The basis? The chewed texture around these holes, suggesting an animal, not a human, made them. Some, such as taphonomist Francesco de Errico, believe that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. They argue that while carnivores might might have created two complete holes, Neanderthals, in their attempt to craft the instrument, made the remaining ones. But as research wrangled over the bone's origins, musicologists like Lubin Dimkarski delved into its potential musical applications. The academic musician crafted over a hundred replicas of the flute in an attempt to figure out just how the instrument, which was just a fragment after all, functions. His experiments revealed a potential range of up to three octaves on the flute, a feat quite remarkable for an instrument of its presumed age. But the mystery of this flute lay not just in its notes, but in how it was played. And Dim Karaski was on the case here as well. Using his extensive array of replicas, he eventually came to the conclusion that the easiest and therefore most likely way of playing the flute was using a unique two-handed technique. Should this indeed be correct, it indicates a, a level of musical sophistication that challenges our understanding of early human musicality. Ultimately, the flute, regardless of the ongoing debates, has solidified its place in the annals of archaeology and musicology. It serves as a beacon, drawing experts from various fields to unravel its mysteries. Even if its true purpose should never be fully uncovered, its existence fuels our imagination, giving life to tales of early hominid gatherings around ancient fires serenading the night with melodies echoing through time.
In the deserts of Luxor, Egypt, lies the Sheikh Abd el Qanan necropolis. This web of ancient burial chambers has served as a sepulchre of human innovation for millennia, each tomb a new footnote in the grand book of human history. Among its various treasures, one artifact truly stands out, a 3,000-year-old prosthetic toe known as the Cairo toe, which as you may have surmised from our introduction, is the oldest prosthetic ever discovered. The Cairo toe was unearthed almost two decades ago in the year 2000, being found cradled in a burial chamber thought to belong to the daughter of a high-status Egyptian priest. Shielded from the harsh elements by its tomb, the toe enchanted researchers with its level of preservation and its detailed construction. It wasn't just a simple piece of wood, nor was it a mere aesthetic accessory, but a carefully crafted and adjustable piece of medical technology far more advanced than many later prosthetics. Crafted from a combination of wood and leather, the toe is an exquisite example of multi-material construction, a testament to the advanced understanding of materials and ergonomics of its ancient creator. Modern techniques such as microscopy, x-ray technology, and computer tomography have allowed researchers to study the toe in detail. The analysis showed that the Cairo toe, while looking surprisingly modern, also demonstrates a keen understanding of the human anatomy, as not only was it still perfectly fitted to the foot of its original owner, but it had in fact been removed and regrafted several times, presumably as the wearer grew. But the Cairo toe is not an isolated artifact. The Sheikh Abd al Khana necropolis is a treasure trove of archaeological discoveries, each artifact weaving a new thread into the rich tapestry of ancient Egyptian life. From tombs filled with personal belongings to those repurposed as dwellings, this necropolis offers an intimate, intricate look into the human past. But it is perhaps the Cairo toe, with its blend of practicality and aesthetics, that stands as a testament to the ancient's blend of artistry and practicality. The discovery of the Cairo toe not just expanded our understanding of early medical technology, but also provided an intimate insight into the lives, societal norms, and human experiences of ancient Egyptians. Each modification, each adjustment of the Cairo toe, tells a story of its wearer and her life in a world that's long gone. 